Magic Astrology 101 by Jonathan Barlow Gee. Introduction In this lecture, we will be examining the ancient science behind the modern claims made associated with the field of astrology, which is, among the vulgar, relative to astronomy in an identical way as was alchemy, a predecessor to chemistry. While alchemy remains more an art than an exact science, chemistry is a pure science with no nuance of art. Likewise, astrology has become an archaic, ancestral art form depicting observations currently confirmed and studied by the science of astronomy. However, just as without the cave paintings at Lascaux, we would not have the Sistine Chapel ceiling by Michelangelo. Likewise, we would not have the sciences of astronomy or chemistry without having had their prior forms as the arts of astrology and alchemy. Just as alchemy has its relationship to later schools of psychology that it inspired, such as the interpretations of the anima and animus of C.G. Jung, and the much more in-depth analysis of all the archetypes populating the collective unconscious, proffered forth by Joseph Campbell, there is now a school of thought connecting the ancient craft of metallurgy with a higher spiritual calling, meaning, in short, that the symbols of metallurgic craft were used in alchemy, alike how the symbols of the Masonic craft are used in modern Freemasonry. Similarly, astrology owes its great debt for inspirational influx, not to association of a set of craft tools with a set of higher spiritual variables by an esoteric mystery school tradition, but instead to the mythologies describing ancient pantheons as the relationships of the gods in all these stories describe the higher spiritual beliefs of the various early cultures about their observations of the same events we now catalog under the headings of astronomy, astrophysics, and space weather. The ancients saw the seven visible planets as being merely thrones or palaces inhabited by personages embodying the traits and aspects native to that planet, according to the ancients' imaginings. So when one of the visible planets drew near to another of the visible planets, as in a planetary conjunction or alignment, they saw this as the force or the essence of one enthroned deity passing near to and taking counsel with another. The records of these, over the ages, come down to us now in the chronological ordering of the myths and descriptions of deities by all past and present cultures. Why cultures manifest the study of outer space in the form of zoomorphic and anthropomorphic deities, and describe the relations of the celestial spheres to one another in the heavens using the complex encryption model of religious metaphysics, is due to the media for communications requiring a cipher method in order to accomplish the goal of communication, the transmission of information from one party, individual or group, to another or others. The cipher method communication necessitates is written language, comprised dually of numbers, symbolizing quantities or sums of imaginary objects, and letters, symbolizing phonetic sounds, words made from these letters, sentences made out of these words, and logical argument formed from such sentences, just as hypotheses are founded on equations relating variables, and so on and so on. Written language was, originally, based on symbology alone. Before alphabets were ever conceived, the so-called Chaldean order of the seven visible planets had long been established, and the 
Babylonian zodiac of twelve astrological signs had long been mapped as the terrain behind them on which they moved. So, too, were the three basic principal conditions of all matter known early on, later expressed by alchemists as salt, mercury, and sulfur, and listed by chemists now as solid, liquid, and vapor, understood by the ancients from the three states of water, ice, fluid, and steam. Study of the origins of the Phoenician alphabet yields knowledge that these three groups, the twelve zodiac signs, the seven planetary pantheon, and the three alchemical phases, preceded and inspired the formation of the earliest twenty-two-letter alphabet, combining the prior use of only ideograms, depicting an object such as a tool, a tree, the sun, a god, etc., such as used before then in Egyptian hieroglyphics, or phonograms, symbolizing verbal sounds, nuances of grammar and pronunciation, etc., such as used before then in Ugaritic cuneiform. The general description given for astrology by all the ancient myths, recorded in all the alphabets and languages of the ancient world, from the pre-Hindu Veda the ancient Egyptian and Sumero-Babylonian, to the Hindu legends, Greek myths, and Hebrew Torah, to the teachings of Buddhism, to the veiled astrological symbolisms of New Testament parables contemporary to the Mesoamerican Empire of the Maya, contemporary also to the origins of Zoroastrianism, to the Norse and Celtic European fables, and lastly to the terms used to describe these same phenomena given by modern astronomical science today is simple nevertheless. They all describe a basic system for how these three levels relate and interact with one another. The lowest level being the three states of matter, the middle level being of the seven planets, and the highest level being of the twelve signs of the zodiac. Therefore, there are very obvious cross-cultural parallels between the terms used by various ancient peoples when describing the same set of phenomena. So, for example, we may find the Trimurti of the Veda, Vishnu the Creator, Brahma the Sustainer, and Shiva the Destroyer, symbolic of the past, present, and future aspects of time, equivalent in Egypt to the Ka, Ka, and Ak, or body, mind, energy double, and God form as one's most high self or holy guardian angel, while in Babylon being called Nam, Namtar, and Anzu, meaning respectively fate, that which can be changed, destiny, that which cannot be changed, and any form of freshwater bird, symbolic of the idea of the soul in the afterlife. Called in the Hindu works the gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas, corresponding again to beginning, middle, and end. In the Greek golden age, symbolized along Plato's divided line as the realm of material reality the realm of ideals, and between them the golden mean of mankind, logically ordering itself into a republic, etc. In Hebrew Kabbalah, correspondent to the triune concepts of Ruach, Jekaida, and Chia, the soul, the consciousness, and the willpower, or superego, ego, and id, more appropriately separating nefesh, the flesh, from neshima, the spirit. In Buddhism were the three poisons, the rooster, the wild pig or boar, and the snake, also correspondent to the triune godhead as father, son, and holy ghost, 
in Catholic Christianity, the keepers of the mats from the end of the Mayan Popol Vuh, Jaguar Knight, Jaguar Quiche, Dark Jaguar, and Not Right Now, to the realms of light, of darkness, and between them of matter, being the origins of Ahura Mazda, Aramon, and Zoroaster, respectively, in Zoroastrian Mazdaism, and also corresponding to the Triskali knot in Celtic rune lore, and to Odin, his sister wife Freya, and their son Thor in the Nordic lore of the Vikings, and no less so to the salt, sulfur, and mercury of alchemy, or the solid, gaseous, liquid conditions of matter used in modern chemistry. Just so, again, for the seven visible planets, we find that they correspond with the seven Vedic chakras, nerve centers along the spine, in Egypt to the seven Ba of Ra, the seven horses drawing the chariot of the sun god, in the Babylonian king's list to seven Anunnaki kings who reigned prior to the great deluge, in Hindu to seven divas or archangels, in the Greek to seven of the Olympian pantheon, particularly the family of Zeus, in Hebrew to the seven days of the first week of creation, in Buddhism to the six local realms of the Siddha Bardo and the seventh, their map, the eightfold Dharma, including the four noble truths of suffering and their negations, in the Book of Revelations, seven seals and seven churches. In Gnostic Christianity, the seven powers. And in Coptic Christianity, the seven Nephilim generations, the sons of God, or sons of light, that ruled the five nations of Edom prior to the flood. In the Mayan cosmology, correspond to the houses of the lords of the underworld, the so-called Zabalba Bay, including the World Tree and the Crossroads, in Zoroastrianism and Yazidi, Hebrew and Christian Kabbalah, and in Islam, to seven archangels, in Norse literature, to the nine realms or worlds of Yggdrasil, the World Tree, in the seven metals of alchemy, corresponding to the seven visible planets of astrology, and finally to the six possible directions in three-dimensional space, plus the additional singular direction, one half of a dimension, measuring time. Likewise, the twelve zodiac signs in Vedic were the twelve chi meridians, nerve bundles, in Egyptian were the twelve realms of the Amduat, the underworld along the river of death. In Sumerian were twelve Anunnaki rulers over twelve planets, including Nibiru, Tiamat, Kingu, and Ki. In Hindu were twelve Asuras, or demons. In Greek were the full Olympic pantheon, sometimes including the Titans, their predecessors. In Hebrew were the twelve tribes that descended from Jacob Israel. In Buddhism were the six realms of the loka wheel doubled as ascending or descending. In Christianity were twelve apostles, and in Gnosticism were twelve archons. In Mayan were the twelve Zibalba, the lords of the underworld. In Shiite Islam were twelve occultations of imams. In Norse were the twenty-four runes divided with two over each lunar house or mansion. In Chinese astrology were a repeating cycle of years, and in Chaldean astrology were the zoomorphs of the zodiac, and finally are twelve aeons of two thousand year long spans apiece by which we measure the calendar of 24,000 years, dating the north-south hemispheric reversals of ice ages. 
In this lecture, we will be examining in specific certain diagrams depicting these basic number sum sets of 3, 7, and 12, as well as variations on these as they arise. There may be several different arrangements possible for the variables used to label these diagrams, and the models in these diagrams are also not the only models possible for depicting these variables on either. However, for the most part, the models and variables depicted in diagrams throughout this lecture can at least serve as a satisfactory starting off point, a formative square one, so to speak, upon which to base further, more exacting study. Part 1. The Base 3 System There are, literally, countless arrangements of virtually unlimited variables into base 3 sets. Having dealt elsewhere already with the history of the Triangle of Summoning, Confer Magic Ritual 101, it nevertheless bears repeating from the list of ten triplicities from the Tree of Death, page 106, a few we overlooked in the introduction to this lecture, namely, the Thelemic Light, Love, Light triplicity, the Krishna Sat, Being, Chit, Mind, Ananda, Bliss, triplicity, the Hellenic Hebrew Tetragrammaton, Primamaton, and Aphaxaton, Triplicity, the Weapons of Magical Ritual, Chain, Scourge, and Dagger, Triplicity, and the Masonic Triplicity of Jubella, Jubello, and Jubellum. Again, however, all these variables, when arranged onto any base 3 model, will correspond to one another, even if only because of the base 3 numerology underlying all of them. You can compare a triplicity combining Osiris, Horus, and Set Typhon with any other triplicity, such as, say, that of Three Eyes, the Ujatit, or Evil Eye of Horus, the Right Eye of Ra, and the Urius, or Third Eye, symbolic of the Mind's Eye and compare and contrast their similarities, which will be possible simply because both are base 3. Ultimately, however, in this lecture, our approach will be psychological, however, and we will be looking at the triplicity of body, mind, and soul. And to compare it to another base 3 model, we will be thinking of it in terms of shadow, object, and light source, respectively. Suffice it to say, the triplicity, base 3 trait, is everywhere within all historical metaphysical systems, and all of these occurrences are describing aspects and conditions that, perhaps, can best be modeled using a simple ball sitting on a surface, casting a shadow behind it from a light source held in the foreground. Three cannot be arrived at prior to starting from square one. And to demonstrate this, allow me to show a series of purely geometric designs. The first is the simple circle, a circumference with all points equidistant from its centroid. Then let us divide this from one into two and demonstrate the Vesica Pisces symbol, well known from throughout ancient so-called sacred geometry. Now, just as two emerged out of one, three small circles can emerge out of the overlapping and non-overlapping portions of the twin circles locked into the Vesica Pisces symbol. So we see, finally, a model depicting three out of two out of one, using only circles of varying width diameters and it will be this model onto which we will, lastly, assign the variable traits and aspects we wish to study here. In the final labeled diagram, we see the labels signifying the three levels of body, below, mind, middle, 
and Kabbalah above. Within the twin medium-sized circles locked in the vesica shape, and these being labeled aura below and soul above, and these being all within and inside the all-encompassing largest circle, in turn labeled spirit. Part 2, the base 7 system. Just as the base 3 system of alchemical salt, mercury, and sulfur symbolize in an occult manner the base 3 conditions of matter demonstrated by H2O, solid, ice, liquid, water, and gas, vapor, so to a level upward and outward surrounding and around these base three correspondences is a higher plane that manipulates and moves the correspondences that align with one another on the base three size scale of the model. However, just as the elements of these base three correspondences relate to chemistry and to the stillness or excitation of the molecules of a substance, the elements of base 7 correspondence are more complex forms, both on a cellular neurological scale and on the scale of the space weather exchanged between the atmospheres of the local planets. The seven chakras are, on one hand, merely an antenna for tuning into the influences on our chemistry by the seven visible planets in our local solar system. I should perhaps clarify here about the visible planets. Although traditionally counted in antiquity, the Sun and Earth's Moon are not technically planets as such, but there do remain seven, roughly, visible planets in our solar system, including Uranus and Neptune. So before we begin to examine the seven chakra system and the receiving nerves in our spines, let us examine firstly these seven local planets and how their atmospheres reflect the weather in our own due to the shared effects of local space weather and why their locations relative to our own planet affect our seven chakras in the ways they do. To demonstrate all this, all we will need will be a relative model of the solar system. Obviously, in this depiction, the planets and their orbits are not proportionate to their actual sizes and orbital distances in reality. Let us begin by looking at this diagram unlabeled, and then let us add the labels for each of the planets we can see depicted. So here we may see the order of the planets shown outward from the Sun at the center is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Next, let us look at how each of the planet's distances relates it to our planet Earth. Here we see that all the planets, beside Uranus, are clustered on the Sun side from the Earth. Mercury and Venus are closer to Earth than is the Sun and Mars is at its furthest away. Jupiter and Saturn are nearby one another, conjunct, in the same quadrant as Mars. Now let us drop the logos and gravitational influence lines from the diagram and wind the whole mechanism forward one year, or exactly one of Earth's orbits around the Sun. Now, when we arrive at this date, a year later on the relative model, we can see the locations of the planets relative to one another have changed, some very little, some very drastically. In the given diagrammatic example, we find that now Mercury, Venus, and Mars have joined Uranus on the Earth side of the Sun, now with only Neptune in one quadrant and Jupiter retreating from Saturn in another. In the same way the gravitational pull of the moon influences the tides, 
by dragging all Earth's waters towards it. The visible planets each have a unique effect on the chemistries native to one another. What this means on Venus is an atmosphere of 96.5% carbon dioxide and 3.5% nitrogen, a more volatile and hostile environment for biological organisms such as those on Earth to exist in, and made less habitable by its closer proximity to the Sun, Earth's star. But what this means on Earth or on Mars is very different. Between Venus and Mars exists a temperate zone, wherein dwells Earth, third from the Sun, with its habitable terrain and atmosphere, and its chemistry ripe with evolution. Beyond the asteroid belt, further from the Sun than Mars, lie the gas giants, enormous planets that have thick, volatile atmospheres with relatively small amounts of solid core mass compared to their gaseous volumes. Around each of these planets orbit moons, and all these moons have their own relative push and pull with their own host planets, just as our own Earth's moon affects Earth's tides. Just as Earth's moon influences the H2O chemistry of the Earth, so too do Phobos and Deimos, the orbiting satellites of Mars, affect the 95.97% carbon dioxide, 1.93% argon Martian atmosphere. And so too are all the solar system's planets' weathers directly related to and in large part produced by the space weather being created by the Sun, which in turn exists in a broader galactic scale system whereby the solar weather is affected relative to the black hole at the core of the Milky Way galaxy, that of which our Sun is in the fourth spiral arm outward, the Orion Spur between the Sagittarius and Perseus arms. So, just as the Sun takes 240 million years to complete one orbit around the Milky Way's core black hole, a so-called galactic year. So the Earth takes 365.25 days to comprise a single year by orbiting the Sun once, and so the Moon orbits the Earth every 27.321 days, and each day is measured as the, on average, 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.1 seconds it takes Earth's 40,075.017 kilometer equatorial circumference to complete a single revolution of 360 degrees around its core. From each scale layer to the next, the greater affects the lesser more than vice versa, and the effects caused on a greater level precede and result in the effects seen later on a lesser level. So the gravity from the Milky Way's core black hole affects the sunspot cycle of our sun, and so this sunspot cycle affects the weather on all its local planets, and thus from them to all their moons. Thus, while the space weather at the core of the Milky Way might not have much immediate effect on Earth, being as we are 8.33 kiloparsecs, or around 27,200 light-years away from its direct influence on us. Nevertheless, via the space weather its distant effects generate on the Sun, our local star, the sunspot cycle is peaked, and the weather patterns of the local planets are thrown into relative turmoil. And. Just as the sun acts as an amplifying antenna, receiving, reflecting, and multiplying the gravitational effects of the Milky Way's core black hole, so too do our own human chakras act as amplifying antennae, receiving, reflecting, and multiplying the microgravitational effects 
of the planets on our own biological terrestrial chemistry. This is the most fundamentally basic assertion of astrology. The local planets have a microgravitational effect on one another's innate chemistries. On Earth, this includes all living beings. Thus, the planetary influence of Saturn corresponds to the Muladhara, or base chakra, of Jupiter to Svadhisthana, the gonads, of Mars to Manapura, the guts, of the sun to Anahata, the heart, Venus to Visuddha, the throat, Mercury to the Ajna, third eye, and the moon to Sahasara, the crown. These assignations are, apparently, arbitrary to the mind of the modern Western skeptic. They are, nonetheless, as ancient in their orderings in the Middle East as the Chaldean order of the planets, according to a series of so-called Kamiya number squares, and in the Far Eastern Orient as the chakras, as at least the Babylonian and Vedic civilizations in the Levant and Indus subcontinent, respectively. Assuming, nevertheless, that the base seven attributes are all variables, capable of being corresponded to each other in any variety of different ways, this ancient ordering may be seen as somewhat oversimplifying. For example, it could be said that the Muladhara chakra is simply the chakra most in tune with the planetary influence of Saturn, but that the other chakras are all as subject to being influenced by this planet's microgravitational pull on them, as is the Muladhara chakra. It is simply that Muladhara is the chakra most attuned to receive and amplify this particular frequency of vibrational wavelengths. This is similar to how, when driving your car, you and your car are constantly being subjected to and bombarded by invisible AM and FM radio waves being broadcast by radio station antennae and satellites, but only the radio in your car is able to pick these up via an antenna as well, and then translate these, via speakers, into audible sound waves. Thus, just as the Muladhara chakra is the antenna in the nervous system most attuned to receiving the planetary influence of Saturn, so is Svadhisthana to Jupiter, Manipura to Mars, and so on and so forth, up to Sarhasara to Earth's moon. Although this idea of the chakras being neural antennae attuned to receiving and amplifying microgravitational wavelengths from the various local planets seems a very simple concept. It remains a mystery, prohibiting astrology from being an accepted science and that keeps it enshrouded in the obscurity of the arcane arts. Part 3 The Base 12 System the base 12 zodiac system serves as a calendar and as the backdrop against which the seven planets play out their shadow puppet show. The base 12 zodiac is, simply enough, reverse engineered from a 360 degree circle. The 360 degree circle was, in turn, based on the earliest rudimentary calculations for the number of days in a year. It was reckoned there were four seasons per year, and each was given its own holiday, and one annual holiday was added, and thus by addition of these five holidays, the ideal sum of 360 was rendered into the real sum of 365. When the annual holiday was subtracted, leaving 364, this allowed the four seasons to each be divided into 91 days apiece, the 91st being the seasonal holiday. 
Thus, 90 days per each season meant each season could, primarily, be divided into three equal portions of 30 days apiece, and these could be considered by the 12 zodiac signs as houses or mansions of the moon and other local planets. These are not exactly like lunar months, because they do not depend on the moon's phases for measurement, and are, instead, reverse-engineered from the solar-centric calendar. However, they are, also, not exactly like the zodiac constellations themselves, per se, either, because, unlike the constellations of the tropical ecliptic, these houses or mansions of the zodiac remain all of equal measure to one another, all equally comprised of 30 degree increments of one circle, each degree measuring one day on this idealized form of early calendar. Whereas the widths of each actual constellation along the ecliptic are each unique, the length of each month in the ancient reckoning was the same. 30 days. Each such 30 day month was divided into three weeks, each week of ten days being called a deacon of the zodiac, and each zodiac sign being the house or mansion of three such ten-day deacons each. Each deacon was a week of ten days, and each zodiac house was a month of thirty days. There were thus 36 deacons in one year of 360 degrees or 365 days, and thus four seasons of three zodiac houses each, each being 30 day degrees. These are thus the 12 houses of the zodiac. Although this reckoning comprised the ancient calendar for thousands of years, it seems antiquated to a modern mind. Just so, people, to this day, exchange the birth sign from their natal chart as a totem of self-identification. But when someone says, I'm a Cancer, or I'm an Aries, what they are really referring to is the sun sign of the zodiac, and not the actual constellation in which the sun was rising on the day of their birth. This other sign, the rising sign, is very important because it has slipped from alignment with the sun sign over the last 4,000 years. In modern astrology, the dates commonly attributed to the zodiac months on the annual calendar are fixed to where the zodiac signs would have been located 4,000 years ago, but the actual rising sign, symbolic of the constellation rising on the horizon at sunrise on the day of one's birth, has slipped backwards over the aeons by almost two full zodiac signs. For example, my own birthday is October 8th, which puts me in early first deacon, Libra, the constellation of the scales. However, my actual rising sign, that is the sign rising on the horizon on the day I was born, is Virgo on the cusp of Leo. This is the effect over time on the perspective from Earth of the immobile heavens of the ecliptic zodiac's constellations of distant stars. It results from the precession of Earth's axial tilt around a third axis of motion, the rotation of the equator around the polar axis being one, the orbit of the planet around the star being another, and the precession of the polar axial tilt being a third. Over the millennia of thousands of years, the planet has shifted its position to the zodiac of immobile stars just slightly but enough to be noticeable as a shift from one constellation to another on the horizon at any given calendrical date. It does this at such a reliable rate, in fact. The same calendrical model may be used to measure the passage of the aeons, 
spans of 2,000 years each as measures the annual months. Each month read in one direction on the annual calendar is, when read in the opposite direction, equivalent to a span of 2,000 years. The reason for this is that, just as it takes the duration of about one lunar month for the sun to rise and set in one pair of opposed constellations along the zodiac during an average annual orbital year, so too does it take about 2,000 years for the planet's position to shift itself just enough to change what sign will be rising on what date of the annual calendrical year and it does this in the opposite direction along the zodiac from the order followed by the rising sun throughout the year. Conclusion It is not technically accurate to describe the cosmos as a machine, nor a computer, nor to think of human society as a predetermined construct or program that was built or encoded into this cosmic machine from its first recorded moment. The reason this is not a technically accurate comparison is not because the comparison is untrue, but instead it is because the cosmos preceded machinery and computers and not vice versa. So it is more right to say a machine is like a miniature cosmos or that a computer is like a model of the universe rather than the other way around the cosmos is like a machine or the universe is like a computer we have been given limited elements to use to build up a future for our planet with and we have used these as best as we have been able to but our resources were ultimately limited alike the language available to a computer using a program, or like the cogs and gears in a simple machine. Because humanity has had to work with what we have had available for us to work with, what we have built out of it is thus one half comprised only of the value of Earth's own substances, and the other one half comprised of our own best attempt as humans to replicate our perception of the higher cosmic order that we can perceive in forming and shaping all events, both sociological and human, as well as astrological and cosmic.